In order to approach the Old Testament as a compound, we know that for Christian people, the Old Testament forms a background or frame for the Messianic revelation to which Christendom is particularly uh, addicted religiously. Now, this is entirely a different viewpoint from that of the Orthodox Jews. He does not regard the Old Testament as reading a complementary Bible or work. He is willing to admit that particularly the prophetic books of the Old Testament do contain information or announcement of the coming of a Messiah. Uh, Christian theologians have assumed that these intimations and implications refer to the advent of Jesus. Here, of course, is one of the major points of difference between Judaism and Christianity. This attitude is not acceptable in general to the Orthodox Jewish scholar. He points out many elements of the Old Testament account which would sustain his position that the New Testament is not the fulfillment of the Old. If the two books have been brought together for other purposes, or at least have achieved a different purpose. In survey, we must remember that the New Testament, as it stands, is essentially a moral historical document. It deals with the life of Jesus of Nazareth, and to a degree of the lives of his immediate disciples and apostles, it passes into the Pauline epistles and gradually develops a related to you of literature. It is a powerful moral work. It is a tremendous statement of mystical faith. And it is a strong and definite revelation of religious ethics. If the New Testament is deficient in one particular, when compared with most of the sacred books of the world. Mm-hmm. It is deficient in cosmology. It is deficient in anthropology. In other words, it does not carry into its own substance any essential description or explanation. For this reason, the Old Testament forms an appropriate background it answers certain questions concerning the race and the nation for which Jesus came, the beliefs of this race, the unfoldment of their religious and political psychology, the rise and fall of their national existence. And furthermore, it gives us a broad picture of the psychological structure of the Jewish people of that time and of their religious problems and of their general attitude towards the essentials of spiritual life. That it should be included seems to be more than justified for the words of Jesus himself, when he has proclaimed definitely that he came not to destroy the prophets, but to fulfill them. And in order that the position of the prophet whom he came to fulfill might be understood, it was almost inevitably necessary to link the Old Testament and the New. The Old Testament was not written originally in the same language as the New Testament. The linguistic difficulties in the older Chaldaic Hebrew are far more ponderous and numerous than those of Greek. Up to the present time, no really ancient manuscript of the Old Testament in the Jewish writings is known. Nearly all of the so-called now to be found in synagogues, are translations and retranslations from the Greek. The oldest manuscripts of the Old Testament are to be found in the great Greek manuscripts of the Bible, the Sanyatis and the Vatican. These manuscripts, dating from about the third century, are the oldest comprehensive groups we have. There are earlier fragments. They do not give us too large or full an understanding. 
Thus we know that we are confronted with serious problems of language. And we must gradually recover from our popular belief that the Bible was written in the King James at the request of King James the first of English. It was not. This is an exaggeration. <laughs> The uh, Old Testament was probably revised or codified sometime about the 5th century B.C. There is a strong record, or tradition at least, not on the table, let us point that out, but still rather strongly defended, uh, that the earlier writings were almost completely destroyed, and that during the time of Ezra, a group of scholars forming a rabbinical college, working together, perhaps under the leadership of one or two of the older patriarchs, rewrote or revised and brought into an integrated form the earlier and lost manuscripts of the Jewish tradition. This may or may not be a defensible attitude or belief, but it is certainly traditional and has been in existence for a long time. Nor is it essentially unreasonable, for it is quite possible that a religious literature in uh, Palestine, a thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era, uh, was highly respectable. In those days, manuscripts were very few, and copying was an exceedingly difficult undertaking. Therefore, it is quite possible that not many uh, manuscripts of the Torah, or of the prophetic books, or of the literary works, were available. These could either have been lost or so hopelessly misplaced uh, that they were not available. This point, of course, is also strengthened by the fact that they have never discovered any of And therefore, they could not have been especially numerous. We have many, many copies of Egyptian manuscripts going back as far as 3,000 or 3,500 B.C. But we have no such available manuscripts relating to the Old Testament. Thus it is quite possible that the literature was exceedingly limited in amount and uh, perished or nearly perished from the numerous vicissitudes of the place of the of Israel. So much for its basic uh, historical orientation in the limited time that we have. The second point for consideration is the authorship of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is generally referred to as the five books of Moses. We have, however, no absolute proof that Moses was their author, nor do we gain such an evidence or proof from the reading of the books themselves. Most of the writing is in the third person. This, however, is not again concluded because of the grammatical form used at that time. We do not, however, and the internal or sustained traditional evidence to prove that Moses was the actual author of these books. He is the traditionally accepted author. It is not impossible that he did write that. This is a more of the religious but uncertainty, which is a yet unsolvable. Uh, some groups, composed of rather adequate scholars, are inclined to favor the belief that Moses did write these books. There are others who feel definitely that he probably did not. Then there is a third group occupying a more or less middle ground that point out that according to the custom and the society of the time, Moses undoubtedly would have made you subscribe. In other words, he probably would not have written the book for his own hand. He would have used professional writers or secretaries. And that these may have changed from time to time, and thus uh, we would have certain editorial differences, different methods of presenting material. This is quite possible. Also, we know beyond any reasonable doubt that although we might have attributed the authorship of the Pentateuch to Moses, that there are fragments, sections, and parts of it that are almost certainly derived from older sources. Some of these sources may have been Egyptian. Some of them may have been oral traditions of surrounding tribes and groups. But frequently in the unfoldment of the uh, Mosaic writings, we find interludes or interpolations which can definitely be traced to other sources. 
These include a considerable farm the opening of Genesis. And the uh, Chaldean tables, now in the British Museum, are translated by Professor Piazza Schwein, indicates a considerable part of Genesis' story was derived from the Chaldean Geneophon, a much older tradition, going back long before even the so-called uh, great state of creation. Thus, we uh, can find the probability of several authors or we can find several layers or levels of writing representing extracts from different periods. We must also face the inevitable that there are interpolations of a later date that could not possibly have been written by most. Whether these interpolations were originally glossed and were gradually incorporated into the text, we do not know. But we do know that this particular occurrence has taken place in the Christian writing. And a number of quotes of as late as the 8th century indicate that scribes made marginalia or notes on the edges, and later scribes incorporated these notes into the text, so that we have a little difficulty arising from this gradual loss of lines of demarcation between original material and interpolated or interpreted material of a more recent date. The Jewish religious tradition is a much more complicated one uh, than we are first inclined to assume. Uh, these people, as you can well imagine, uh, being an ancient and oriental nation, developed immense and incredible religious hostility. Uh, they were never content merely to accept the letters and forms and shapes of things. They always sought for something deeper something more important. And in the development of their sacred writings, they appear to have incorporated uh, many mysterious cabal or ciphers into the text of their work. These ciphers originated at least in part from their concept of language. Originally, the uh, old Hebraic or Chaldean Hebraic language was rather more limited than it is today. There was probably a time when the complete alphabet did not consist of more than about 10 or 12 letters. It is sometimes assumed that there were originally seven consonants and, five, and three vowels. This may not be entirely correct, but it does indicate that as we retire further into the background of language, we are inclined to note the increasing signs of deficiency of available words and terms. Uh, this particular problem does present itself to Bible students. Uh, we are not at all sure of all of the grammatical constructions of the old Jewish and Rabbinical teachers. Uh, the same problem confronts us with the Christian heritage. Uh, since the work of Caporium and the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, we can translate uh, such Egyptian manuscripts as the books of the dead and other surviving fragments, descriptions, states, uh, mortuary uh, offerings, to that prayer. But we are not at all sure that we are exhausting the potential of the language. Dr. Press of the University of Chicago told me in his work in connection with Egyptian languages that he was quite certain that many of the word signs and glyphs had double meaning and that we have simply lost the knowledge of the better and deeper meaning. This would be definitely true in connection with the old Jewish language. Jewish scholars themselves know definitely that there are meanings to these words and to the combinations of them uh, with which we are no longer familiar. Therefore, that we can read the surface, but we cannot penetrate to the subsurfaces of the ideas and mental processes of the time. This could and does lead to a great deal of danger and error. But where we, uh, we have not the psychic sympathy with the original, we cannot any longer relive the idiom of the article. We are at a very serious disadvantage. Even today, the American people do not use their language correctly. And if a scholar does use it correctly, he is likely to be misunderstood. <laughs> and uh, this follows all the time and habit. Words change their meaning. 
were in increasing importance and decrease and structured in the same way. The beginning of the study of the Old Testament then should naturally and reasonably begin for a careful study of the philosophy of the great writers. Without some knowledge of this particular field, there is always going to be a very difficult situation at hand. The writing is not always on the surface. The writing is definitely subsurface. We know, for example, that uh, due to certain religious conditions, the old texts are left without followers. <coughs> without followers. And the latest development of the diagram of Mark does not indicate any sure knowledge of where they belong or how they should originally have been used. Thus, we have only traditional forms, and even these things from time to time. The Hebrew writing, or the Chaldean Hebrew records, have a common origin, and it is rather important to give a little thought to that as we go by. I'm not going to step down that far. <laughs> Great <laughs> <laughs> letter, the Hebrew alphabet, is a tiny little mark that resembles a comma. It is called a yoint. It is made like that. Now this letter is actually, as far as we can learn, means the plane. In other words, the entire alphabet is composed of combinations of planes. Now, in this we begin to find, for example, something that I have often believed in long perspective, namely, that the Hebrew scriptures are very largely books interpreting the basic concept of Jewish philosophy which is in the letters themselves, and not in the writings of uh, which are composed of these letters. Now, the original letter is susceptible of appearing in numerous patterns and forms. We can take one of these yokes in this way, we can add another yoke to it, and another yoke to it, and we have the Hebrew letter A. And this is really composed of three planes. Now, what does the letter A itself mean in Hebrew? It means fire. Therefore, it is the beginning of the alphabet. It is a restatement of the strange belief of these people in the association of letters and fire. James Gattaro, who was the astronomer and scholar extraordinary to Cardinal Richelieu, <coughs> Believe that these plane points and the original structures of the letters were derived from the constellations. In other words, the these little planes represented stars. And in certain early forms of people writing, we still find them represented as star forms. These then constituted the original of the handwriting of the wall of heaven. Now, if we consider the fixed stars and their groupings to form the continental letters of the Hebrew language, then we are not very far off either when we suspect that the planets moving in the orbit of the constellation became the fathers. And as these bowels constantly change their relation to the continents, it is conceivable that an endless group of words can be formed. And that these words change based on because of the motion of the vowels through the continental form. This is a very old belief, by the way, and perhaps in the science of the Now, in the early Pentateuchal writings, we have the Hellenistic form of the name of God, which is also very important to us at this particular stage in our study, because the name of God is written in this form, the York and uh, the final end. Because it is written from left to right and consists of A L H I M. We generally pronounce that as Elohim, or more perhaps correctly, Elohim. Now it was 
and the medical system and the testament. All of these elements are part of one who claims and peculiar and remarkable story. Perhaps the most important thing that they teach us in a immediate way is, the info, is to convey the information to go further, to realize that uh, we do not exhaust the potential of this situation by memorizing merely the biblical stories themselves. Now, as we have only a certain amount of time, I'd like to more or less check over with you, in brief, the plan, the scheme that unfolds through the Pentateuch. Uh, these books are not merely separate writings. They are the integrated parts of one story. They consist of a prologue, Genesis, and an epilogue, Deuteronomy. And between these two are placed the remaining three books in their order, and in a sequence which is acceptable not only to the historian, but to the psychologist and the sociologist. Concealed within the elaborate oriental process, with its rich uh, emphasis upon genealogies and the defense of families, and its heavy uh, concern with the wanderings of the tribes and their wars, and the various meetings and the various revelations that were given. The story unfolds essentially uh, in a simple way. The purpose of Genesis is not primarily to present the story of creation, for it is limited to only a very few chapters. The true purpose of Genesis is to establish the integrity of the Pentateuchal dispensation. Its purpose is to remind the reader and the student of the setting aside of a chosen people, a people peculiarly and wonderfully provided for and protected, that through them and through their works and through their labor, a dispensational law might be revealed. The entire emphasis in the Pentateuch is upon the unfoldment of this dispensation of law. Now, it is not by any means the theme which exhausts the wealth of the symbolism of these books, but it is the great thread that runs through the five themes. The first book, therefore, deals primarily with the answer to the question, why the dispensation, or the question, how it came about. And in this we see the gradual representation of a selectivity on the part of the creating power. Now this selectivity is perfectly traditional religiously. It is to be found wherever sacred books are found. In every system of sacred books belonging to an ancient people or a race, the integration shows the emphasis upon that racial culture. In other words, the race is explaining itself and is telling the story of its own psychic entity or its own psychic existence. It is telling us the deepest motivations which it can comprehend for its own creation and perpetuation. Thus, in the works in the book of Genesis, we also have a moral or spiritual situation established by means of which the rest of the Pentateuch becomes inevitably necessary. In other words, wherever we develop a, a concept, uh, we must create a pattern. And the concept becomes the basis of the precept, or that which naturally and inevitably follows it. Thus the kind of a dispensation, the rules and laws of its maintenance and of its development, and the need for all of the various ramifications that later arise must be established in the basic premise. And in Genesis, we have the basic premise, not only of the Mosaic tradition, but to a very large degree of the Christian doctrine which followed after. In the opening chapters of Genesis, therefore, we are presented with a story of a divine creation, disobedience, and a fall. In 
other words, we find the individual establishing an interval between himself and God. An interval which must be crossed by repentance, by a life of virtue, by obedience to law, and by the gradual integration of the concept of a moral and religious life. Had the fall not been in the opening chapters of Genesis, there would have been no need for Leviticus or Deuteronomy or Numbers. There would have been no need for a messianic redeemer, unless there had been original sin. So in the year of Pentateuch, we find the primary symbolic statement of man's need. We find the tremendous spiritual necessity by which all of the rest of the work, in fact all the moral cultures of religion, are deemed to depend. Now in this particular instance, we have a situation in which disobedience causes the departure of man from the paradisical state and forces him to take upon himself the burden of original sin. We find, therefore, that he is exiled from his native land or from his proper spiritual abode. He is exiled also from the conscious power to apperceive the presence of God. And after he has been expelled from the garden, he no longer is able to know the Lord who walks in the garden in the pool of the evening. He is deprived, therefore, of the direct and immediate knowledge of God. Now this particular concept, of course, is not original in Jewish literature. It belongs to a great religious tradition which has existed since time immemorial. But it is the springboard, or the foundation, of the life of repentance. It is the concept which lies behind man's search for a lost truth, a lost word, a lost reality, a hidden God. Thus the Pentateuch must establish this, which it does in the opening chapter of Genesis. In this, also in this opening chapter, in these opening chapters, there is a brief summary of what it seems to me is the Sumerian account of the Genesis. In other words, this story is based upon the tradition, lore, and legendary of the Sumerian people, and of the Aka and of other peoples inhabiting the ancient area of the Valley of the Euphrates. Uh, this creation itself, with its customary divisions, uh, this creation uh, can be given a very great deal of consideration. We can only touch upon one or two of the more essential elements of it. We find, for example, that in this creation concept, we are first presented with the concept of the Halloween. Now, I think you should have the Jewish language or Jewish tradition realize this term, Elohim, representing creator power, is an endogenous moral word. The end termination means the equivalent to our end. Therefore, the Elohim cannot be regarded as a monotheistic deity. They can only be accepted as they were in Egypt and in Syria and in other lands, as ammonian opposites, a proof of creating power. And then this, uh, we also find the revival later, uh, which has often been assumed to be an empiric form, but which does not necessarily follow from the Jewish writing. Namely, and God said, let us make man in our image. It seems again to suggest a reference back to the Elohim form, although by that time we are beginning to find the Yahvistic or monotheistic deity uh, taking over in the text. Thus we observe as we proceed that the same word is not used for God in all parts of the Bible. But this term changes. The reason for this change I think we will be able to understand as we proceed. There have been many questions as to where the story of Adam and Eve came from. Again, I don't think we can dogmatize, but research seems to indicate that most of these stories, such as the Osirian legend in Egypt and the cross of Ionesian cycle in Greece, 
and uh, certain of the Brahmanic cycles in Far Asia all originated from religious drama or plays. That in all probabilities at a remote time, uh, these stories were actually enacted, and the candidates seeking initiation into their tribal rights, much of the American Indians of our own Southwest today, passed through initiatory rituals in which religious incidents are dramatized. There is much to indicate from the form and construction that the original story of the fall of man was at some time in a remote past part of the religious pageantry of a great uh, philosophical religious system. And that gradually the story was transformed into an account where it was at one time had been witnessed or beheld as an actual dramatic action. The story itself deals undoubtedly with certain factors which have been universally revered by mankind since the beginning of time. The study of the name Adam, like the study of the name Eve, uh, also tells us that we are not primarily dealing with people. We are dealing with collectives or we are dealing with qualities of life and consciousness. We are not dealing with a physical, biological story. And this is one of the solutions which will ultimately be very valuable to us. Because when we begin to recognize the philosophical intent of the, of the matter and the symbolism used, we are no longer in conflict with physical anthropology. We are no longer in conflict with science. Because our problem belongs on an entirely different level. Therefore, it does not necessarily uh, mean that to believe in the Bible, you must disbelieve in the glacial period and in the vast antiquity of man. We are dealing actually with a problem in physical phenomena or a problem of internal experience and not necessarily merely with something that might have happened in the world four or five thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era. With recognizing this remedy as being very important to us, we can begin to uh, understand uh, again, certain of the uses of the terms and signs and symbols which we find in the old Jewish law. And so we have a great deal of interesting and adventurous time with these problems. I'll just take the, uh, the second of the sacred names that we referred to, and that we will again also put now in a vertical form. You have to be very careful not to connect this letter here. If you connect, it becomes a different letter. But now we have the four letters in the name of Jehovah, or Yahweh, or the Lord, placed in a vertical position. The moment they are placed in that position, we see that they form the human body. It's very obvious. <laughs> Now, there is an interesting statement in the Bible that the man is the head of the woman. Have you ever really caught that? It's a very easy statement. All right. And that can cause a lot of trouble in the Bible. Because we don't believe that anymore. But here I would say that we, uh, we go back to the old rabbinical law and we take the head away. What do we have left in Hebrew? We have H, D, H, or E, D, E. <laughs> therefore, we have, therefore, a strange problem. If we take away the head, we have the woman left. <laughs> Tremendously stimulating and interesting. 
Because actually the name of deity is composed of four parts represented by the four letters, which in turn represent the power of God in the four worlds, which include, of course, Athena, Athena, and uh, Rhea, and the other parts of the ancient the great universe. The symbol of Eve became, in the ancient Hebrew, the symbol of the world soul, or the psychic nature of man. And of course, it is in this context that we find the division used in the Bible. In the great commentaries on Genesis, found in old Jewish writings, we find, according to the story, that Adam was created and loved that he consisted of two bodies back to back. And the so-called creative act consisted of the separating of these two bodies, each of which faced a different way. And according to the old Mosaic tradition, have always faced a different way ever since. <laughs> <laughs> and yet these two, each facing a different way, traveling as far as they can apart in the with the meat, because they must inevitably travel in the great circle of absolute, of absolute or the tremendous cycle of time. So that the further they apart they get, the nearer they come together, mm -hmm. uh, which the old scholars knew in a very ancient time. They realized, as Einstein later demonstrated, the curvature of the continuum, and that anything continuing forever in a straight line will form a circle. So in the Old Testament and in all these writings, Eve, the mother of the living, and uh, the great symbol of the, uh, the creative psychic power of deity, uh, was an essential attribute of deity, which was transferred in the formation of male and female from the universe to man himself. So that in a mysterious way, deity was divided to form the man. And the reformation or the union of man as male and female restores the earth. It is in the beginning of the Roman water, but the philosophy of each step of this is deep and leads us almost inevitably to realize that the Bible is a very wonderful work if we can understand it. Now, in the beginning, according to Genesis, the spirits of Elohim moved upon the face of the deep. That is, a tremendous creative power <clears throat> moved in the form of the fiery whirlwind. In the Greeks, it is said, the universal creation was the result of the striving of ether and chaos. And in the East Indian philosophies, we have the same concept in the formation of the great age of the Aranya Java, which was formed out of the whirlings of space. And the striving, or as it was called, the labors or bearings of space, resulted gradually in the emergence of a conditioned existence out of an unconditioned existence. This is far better in the actual Jewish than the translation that we have in English. So much nearer to the meaning it would be in the first chapter of Genesis. Out of the everlasting, we say in the beginning. But more correctly, it was the out of the everlasting, or the male-female creating power, fashioned or caused to emerge, or generated of themselves, the substances of the superior and the inferior <laughs> creation. In other words, they brought forth two things, like the golden silver hemispheres of the great the age of things in the age. They brought forth differentiation. In the Pythagorean, the one fell into the two that become the basis of diversity. So in the beginning, an unconditioned and eternal state was divided into condition. And in this condition which first existed, there was that which was inner and that which was outside, <coughs> that which was superior and that which was inferior, that which was above and that which was below, all in terms of quality not in terms of location. 
And out of these two polarized principles, all Ether and Chaos that agree. There were factions, or caused to come forth, the mysterious principle of creation itself. Creation, in order to exist by the rabbinical code of the old law, must first become unbalanced. Space must unbalance itself, creating a superior and inferior, an abundance and a privation. A bit and a habit. And out of these imbalances, the great motion toward equilibrium began. And creation is the motion toward equilibrium. Thus we have in the Safar of Zohar, the books of the splendor, the old statement that unbalanced forces perish in the void. Thus passed the giants and the kings of Edom of ancient times. Unbalanced in it, is in itself inevitably destructive. Therefore, the moment it comes into existence, every resource of the universe moves toward equilibrium. The unbalance cannot be permitted to continue. And yet, unbalance is the dynamic. Unbalance is therefore original sin. Because it is the only thing in the universe that requires and demands and must have immediate correction. Therefore, the moon, unbalance exists. Every potential of nature moves towards the restoration of equilibrium or the restoring of harmony. So in the beginning, the mysterious scales which we find in the Egyptian mystery tip. And in the tipping of the scale, objectivity was created. This tipping of the scale was the loss of totality, the breaking up of complete integration or wholeness, and the establishment of relatives in the place of, that, of the absolute. The moment these relatives were engendered, the moment relationships existed, they, in the words of the Greek, they hastened toward each other to form again reintegration or reorganization. In the Hebrew tradition, it is taught that these two opposites, having become what we would term spirit and matter, or life and the absolute, or relative absence of life, because even these old physicists were, were, were well aware of the fact that there is no total absence anywhere in nature. These lives, moving together, found that in a great cycle of existence, that they had built around themselves coats of skin, bodies, forms. The Hebrew word is almost the same as the Greek, and that is Chiton, meaning a cloak or a garment. And these coats of skin, personality, inhibit the reunion of divided parts. Therefore, things seem to meet, but they do not. Because the life within them is prevented from mingling. Because of the external instruments which have been created through time and existence. Thus, the motion toward identity is frustrated by the instruments which these divided parts have fashioned for themselves. Thus we have minds and emotions and bodies and instincts and attitudes and, ap and attitudes and appetites. And by these we are divided. And by these the unified life within us is unable to be restored in its original pattern and form. Thus the answer became the second part of our, of our great problem. Uh, we follow through in the story of Genesis and we observe uh, the gradual intensification of the conflict between reality and unreality. The conflict that has to exist or, un or reality itself is without substantiation or without truth. It is only therefore through the experience of illusion that man is capable of the acceptance of reality. A good example of this is Carl Bayer. Here we find the individual or man attempting to break through or to pierce into the mysteries of heaven. We find him creating a great figure up or power from the earth, which is to reach up to the gods. We find this end only in a confusion of tongues, which is an internal reminder of man that the things which he builds, he builds with bricks of mud without straw. Thus, the entire story of man's attempt to physically conquer the mystery of life is psychologically revealed through the fable of the Tower of Babylon. The power which finally collapsed and resulted in the confusion of tongues, 
And we assume that these conclusions to come in representation to the bringing up of language. But this is not actually true, because we understand that language is the key to the entire mystery that we are dealing with here. Uh, the division of tongue is meaning, actually, the division of man's comprehensive power of work. It's something that is being restored to us after many centuries by the rising interest of man. We know, for instance, that the confusion is not in the form of the words, but in their meaning. And that every word means to the individual only what he himself possesses of knowledge. Therefore, that through words we cannot actually communicate ideas except that those who communicate must be on a common level. Otherwise, words, 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 and there is no profit in them. This uh, experience revolves more or less wrong. Now, also in the opening chapters of Genesis, we come upon the Noah legend, the legend of Noah and his wonderful art, and of the first destruction of the world, or the uh, final passing away of the Andalusian creation. These are all psychological experiences within the human being himself. And in the theological systems of other nations, we find accounts which are parallel to those in Genesis. For instance, in the Chinese system, the first patriarch, his wife, their three sons, and their three daughters were all brought into a ship and carried over to oblivion, exactly as in the Jewish story. We have an almost identical account in India also of an extraordinary antiquity, far older than anything that we have in the Palestine area. So that we know that we are dealing with principles, we know that we are dealing with power. We know, we know also that we are dealing with archetypal forms that will re return in the experience of the individual in each of the culture systems which he produces. In the North legend, we find, for example, the, the return or the retiring of the creation. We find the destruction of an old world and all that is good for. We find the good man and his family saved by the divine intercession. And that from this good man and his family, and from the clean and the unclean animals of the earth, a rich population is taken for. So the floor occupies the situation or position of a second Adam, and is so listed in the ancient chronicles and in the ancient patterns of things. And in Hebrew also, we have Adam Kadmon, Adam of the Red Earth. We know that uh, this Adam Kodman is the archetypal man, the protagonist of Plato. That Adam represents the collective, and if the numerical power is identical with that of the temple of Jerusalem. We know, therefore, that in a mysterious way in the Old and New Testament, that the, the destiny of Adam is linked with that of the Messiah. So the first shall be last. And every one of these statements has the history and has a complete and wonderful significance for us. In approaching these problems, we have been inclined, <laughs> perhaps to be a little influenced by veneration. Uh, we have not felt, perhaps, that uh, the mysteries of heaven were for us. But therefore, it is our problem and our duty and our responsibility in merely to believe and follow. This, however, is not the general attitude of even the old Jewish scholars. Uh, they firmly believe uh, that the supreme power had given them faculties and abilities in order that they could use them. They did not feel that the divine being would have bestowed upon man and mind and the powers to think if he was not expected to use them. And that as the most natural inquiry of the mind is its relation to itself and to its origin and to its destiny, these questions must be proper to man or he could not fashion them within his own consciousness. Therefore, we come to a certain statement in the Old Testament, which I think is a good example of poor translation. There is a line in the Bible which says, The mysteries of God are below the kingdom. Now, actually, we are not translating the uh, words correct. The key words of it are that the sword is for the cottages. Now, that does not mean that the mysteries of God are for those who fear him. The sword is the body or the arcana, the, the, the total wisdom. It is the, the tremendous esoteric law, uh, the complete structure of truth and understanding as it is conceivable to man. 
The word has two essential meanings. One, wisdom itself, and another, the circle or guardians of wisdom. The term is almost interchangeable. Well, the second part is, in other words, eternal wisdom or the great truth or the inevitable reality is our form of happiness. Well, the happiness or happiness represented the initiation of the ancient rites. Those who were the advanced complete. Those who were privileged to enter into the wisdom. Those who had purified and practiced the disciplines and had dedicated their lives to God. Therefore, our word is not the mystery of God or for those appearing. But that the eternal wisdom is for those who are worthy, who are tested, who have made the necessary advancement and proficiency, and are in themselves enlightened and consecrated. Now that is quite a different meaning, because there is no part of the statement which implies fear. Uh, it implies entirely devotion, integrity, and attainment. Thus we have followed for a long time certain misconceptions. Uh, which can and do uh, affect our ability to understand the basic situation. Go on then, also, uh, we have to pause for a moment now and consider the life of Moses because of his tremendous place in this entire context. The word Moses we consider to apply primarily to a man, and we are looking somewhere in the story in this conflict between the Jewish scholars, the Christian scholars, the modern scientists, and uh, the unbelievers, who are all more or less lost on these problems, we are looking for the true meaning of this. Now, we have no reason to doubt the historicity of Moses. In other words, uh, we can by no means question or fail the probabilities of his life. But wherever we find a human and natural person involved in a religious mystery or incorporated ultimately into a scriptural writing, we find certain changes made in the physical and historical story of his life. We find that he is gradually transformed into an archetypal form. In other words, he must be more than a person. He must be the embodiment of the doctrine which he brings. So by degrees, step by step, the human attributes come to be generally ignored. Little by little, he emerges only in his archetypal form. They are no longer primarily interested in the normal daily occurrences of his life. They are not interested in his personal mistakes or his personal uh, limitations. Gradually, he assumes the form of the universal embodiment of a doctrine. We know this occurred in the case of Moses. And we suspect, therefore, that we do not even know the name of the man with whom the story is now associated. Moses is a combination of letters, and is a very important combination of letters. It is almost too important to be a name. It is too far to attest to be a name. Because all we have to do is follow a certain rule of the ancient Jewish Samatria, and we arrange these letters according to the formula. And we have, instead of Moses, Samach. And the moment we have Samach, we have the Son. So we know that Moses is the soul of the enemy. We know, therefore, that he has been gradually associated with the Son's cycle. In other words, that there is lurking, concealed somewhere in this story, what we know today as the astronomical mythos. We know that Moses is therefore also an embodiment of the symbolical principle for which the sun itself stands in nature. Because even the alternative so-called sun worshiper did not and never did worship the physical body of the sun. He worshiped a principle. He worshiped the principle of life. He worshiped the principle of truth, which is inner life. He worshiped the principle of reality, which by its own existence dispels darkness. In other words, some worship is right worship. Right worship is a symbolic statement of truth worship. It is the statement of man's concept of the victory of mental, spiritual, and spiritual life over ignorance, darkness, sin, and death. It can always exist. So we are not surprised to find in the name of Moses the secret concealed name of the Son of 
We are inevitably uh, likely to find them. Moses was a light bearer. Moses, Moses was a light giver to his people. The nature have honored him by representing him symbolically as a kind of sun rising out of darkness. It would only be appropriate to what we generally know already, or what we already have reason to explain or understand in these religious terms. The light of Moses, therefore, has to do with Israel, with the descent of a chosen people, and with the emergence of himself as an archetypal symbol of the Mosaic Law. He is the Law. He is the Law personified or embodied. He is strangely and wonderfully expresses not only its depth but its limitation. He is the revealer and he is the statement of the revelation. And as you study his relation to the structure of the Pentateuch, you become more and more convinced that you are dealing with a principle rather than essentially a person. Now this does not mean that we deny that the person lives. But we also know that uh, even in Christianity, this particular situation has dynamically arisen. In the fourth century, and one of the folks said that the 25th day of December is not so sacred for the birth of Jesus as for the annual, annual birth of the Son. We know also that the birth of Jesus was made to coincide with the uh, winter solstice at a considerably later time than we would first imagine. We realize that all of these stories finally do tie with an astronomical phenomenon that was noted and recorded at a very early date by primitive people most of whom were involved in what we call astrology, or the religion of the stars, the religion of the bodies moving in the heavens. In fact, it's clearly indicated in the vision of Ezekiel, and in parts of the vision of Isaiah, and many others of the early uh, prophetic and literary books of the Bible. Moses, therefore, must be understood as representing the archetypal concept of law, he is the law. And the story of Moses is the story of the law unfolding in a people. And it is also the, the story of the revelation of a great moral code. A code that uh, not only we should examine, but the basic reason for which we should try to understand. Now with Moses, as with most of the other characters which are involved in the Old Testament story, we see a descent also of beliefs and tradition. Moses found in the bulrushes. Moses raised in the land of Egypt, which is the symbol of darkness, always in the biblical account. Uh, the same as the uh, city of Babylon in, in the um, stories or the famous uh, theological writing of St. Augustine. <laughs> always the city of Egypt represents matter, darkness, Ignorance, materiality. It represents the same in the story of the prodigal son, which is another example of the same basic idea. The prodigal son goes into the land of Egypt to waste his substance and riot his living, and finally returns to his father's house, where he is forgiven and the fat and calf is offered for him. These stories all have to do with the cycle of life and with the cycle of the revelation of consciousness and form. And on that psychological level, they are tremendously important. Now, if you will look back at the different doctrines and beliefs, and even the fairy tales and legends that you have enjoyed and known through the, uh, through the years, you will find the constant repetition of the Moses figure. The Moses figure, for instance, is the angel. We always think of it as a magnificent form that is represented in the statue by Michelangelo. We see this great bearded angel. He looks almost like the proverbial concept of God himself. We see him leading his people through the mysteries of the wilderness. We see him leading them out of Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea, and all of these stories which will later have much more meaning for us. We find him also bringing them ultimately to the promised land. And there on the lonely hill of Moab, 
this great teacher and leader of his people lies down to sleep with his fathers. He is not allowed to enter into the promised land because of a sin which he committed, and because he broke the faith of God, and because he broke the tablets of the law, and because he doubted when he struck the rock with his wand. For these things he might not enter in, but he was permitted to see this land of promise from the mountain. And then he went to sleep with the angel. And the place knew him no more, and his body was never found. This uh, interesting parallel in story is itself a very interesting and wonderful story. In the Jewish uh, legendary and lore, it said that God did not send the angel of death to receive to itself the soul of Moses. The Lord came himself and took him home. And this is the concept behind this uh, uh, very strange and deep and wonderful story. But who was it that led the children of Israel into the Promised Land? It was Jehoshua, the son of Nun. Well, what is Jehoshua, the son of Nun? If you write it in Hebrew, you have exactly the same thing as Jesus, the son of the fish. Because the word Nun means fish. The earliest sign of the Christian was fish gone on the sand. So long before the Christian communion knew that it was such a thing as a cross associated with their religion. So the sign of the fish was the ancient symbol of recognition. And the words of the name of Jesus himself becomes, according to St. Augustine, a mysterious cabal by using the first letter we find that from his name comes the name of the fish. We also know that the papal reign is the fisherman's reign. That the great fisherman was the one upon whose foundation the church was built. And that there was a mysterious coin or gold of great merit that was found in the fish's mouth. All these legends are interesting, especially when you tie them to the Hashem of the Son of Man, who would lead the children of Israel along the 49th road of the great Sephiroth era into the Promised Land. When Jesus passed through the uh, four months, Moses passed through 49 gates of the mystery, but only Jesus passed through the 50th, according to the early development of the Christian call. So these things uh, all have their stories, and they all have their involved and intricate and important and wonderful meanings. So we'll follow the life of Moses, but we will follow it a little indirectly, because I want to tie it more directly with the story of the books themselves, with which we have to have a certain amount of consideration. Now, as we've told you, the book of Genesis, by the representation of the nature of creation, by making a definite statement of the outworkings and unfoldings of the divine world, and how these unfoldings uh, were frustrated by the temptation of Egypt, the fall of man, and the exile from the garden. And how, as a result of this exile, man was forced to go forth and earn his bread with the sweat of his brow. And how later we find the tragedy of Cain and Abel and the birth of Seth and the foundation of the priesthood. All of these we find because we know that Israel was not only a person, a tribe, but it was also an epitome of the ancient Jewish concept of all humanity. Israel was humanity, was not essentially originally a race or a nation. It only gradually developed into this as the national pride, national existence took more and more definite shape and form in the minds of the people. But in Genesis, then, we have the foundation of the kind of people dispensation, the law and the prophets. We have the concept arising in this that religion is obedient to law. That therefore man worships God by keeping the covenant of God. And that that which is pleasing under the law uh, brings with it the security and peace of man. Thus we have a very definite statement uh, that religion is keeping the divine plan, keeping the laws that God has created. Now where these laws exist, 
and they are affirmed to exist in Genesis. And we see the gradual unfoldment of these laws. It becomes obvious to anyone uh, that laws can exist without them knowing what they are. And that's when we have been admonished to keep a law. We may be at a sovereign disadvantage. We may not know what the law is. Well, that is not uncommon even in our day of life. There are many people who say, what is good? We simply are not sure. We are not certain to what degree our own judgment, our own patterns, even our general acceptances, our traditions, our creeds, and our codes are true. We do not know. Therefore, the admonition to keep the law must inevitably require the revelation of that law. Someone must know it. And the creation of this concept, that man must keep the statutes, immediately requires the emergence of the law giver. We have not the evidence or proof that these laws are so visibly written that primitive man can understand them. In fact, they are not so visibly written that modern man can understand them. He sees phases, aspects, parts of them, but he is not certain of their totality. He is not certain of what is good in this situation or what is bad in that situation. Thus, the moment we have the revelation, the fiat of the divine being, we then naturally and inevitably are faced with the problem, what is truth? What is the law? How and where should we experience or find the law? So we find in Genesis uh, the beginning of this problem, the statement of it, the gradual unfolding of certain of its basic principles. But we do not yet have uh, the full statement of it. So in the Exodus, which is the second group, the second book of this group, we find the gradual unfoldment of the law. And we find that the law unfolded in Exodus just as it unfolds in the life of the human being. It unfolds through the gradual enrichment of man's experience. It unfolds through historical perspective. It develops through time and circumstance, and especially under the emergency of great and pressing need. During and under which condition, there is greater demand for integrity, greater reliance upon truth. So that the Exodus carries the children of Israel in the long road which leads to the integration of their society. Their integration nationally, their integration culturally, their integration religiously. We find them slowly building the house of their existence. Not only the physical house, for this was still a period of wandering, but a house of convictions, a house of social and psychic patterns, preparing the way, uh, recognizing the need testing and trying and proving their own development. This book, next to this particular, is one of the most powerful historical psychological documents in the entire Bible, where it supports the general belief of the modern sociologists that the only way in which revelation is possible is through the gradual unfoldment of the native psychic entity of a people. But these people must bring forth from themselves that which is necessary to them. The revelation is therefore released. That it is knowledge, wisdom, understanding, moving through a people, binding them, uniting them, and holding them into a gradually integrating pattern. This integrating pattern we see is gradually taking form. We are having it interrupted by innumerable signs. Uh, deviation from the principal text. But by the time we end the study of the Exodus, we see a people emerging into a nation, into a united cooperative unit, a people forming a body. 
and as the body of man must pass through its infancy and through its early growth before it is capable of sustaining uh, the, the soul within it, before the soul power is capable of moving through it and releasing itself. So, in the story of the Exodus, we find the gradual integration of the collective or of the individual psyche. It's moved to the floor and sufficiency and the security suitable to receive further knowledge. And this leads inevitably into the third book, which is the Leviticus. And the Leviticus is nothing more or less than the immediate unfolding of the Levitical ministry as such. And here we find the body of the law slowly taking upon itself its own psychic nature. We find the law becoming the vehicle for the actual uh, presence of an indwelling or an internal truth. We find, for example, uh, the Shekinah column gradually moving. We see the integration of the tabernacle mysteries. We see the Spirit of the Lord hovering over the mercy seat. We know the Shekinah's glory. And we know that the worship of the great archangel Michael who was the psychopompus of heaven and the secret god of Israel, was gradually taking shape. So in the Leviticus, we find the more complete, almost complete, revelation of the whole code, insofar as that code could be sustained and supported by these people. It was the motion of the people toward the integration of their great religious mystery system. It was in the cycle of Leviticus that we find the beginnings of the Kabbalah, the beginnings of secret knowledge, the beginnings of the wisdom that is only for those who have advanced in the apperception of mysteries. So out of the people we find a priesthood. And what is a priesthood, ever? The priesthood is always simply the symbolical pattern of man's own psychic possession. The soul within man is his priesthood. And the collective soul of a people is its priesthood, which must God lead and direct the spiritual and material destiny of that people. So in Leviticus, uh, the old dispensation, the law of the Pentateuch is in soul and becomes a living thing. The breath of life in the form of the great religious overtones are bestowed, and the people is consecrated. It is united as one body of the Lord as the hands and feet of the eternal. Now in this also, we have a further problem. For as soon as man's psychic life integrates, what happens? Does he immediately become happy? Unfortunately not. It is not that easy. The moment the individual takes control of his own spiritual life and his own destiny from within himself, he faces the most difficult situation he has ever faced in his life. He faces uh, what has been called the desert. And this is the, the great place of wandering. So that we have inevitably Leviticus leading to Numbers. Numbers, which is that part which essentially deals with the story of the great sorrow in the wilderness, the great struggle, the struggle against worldliness. The struggle between the rising power of internal light and the darkness of environment. For it is only when the soul is enlightened that it is aware of the conflict or the contrast between itself and that which is not itself, that which constitutes the period in the wilderness. Therefore, the story, as we find it in Numbers, is like the initiation ritual of one of the old mysteries. It is the story of man wandering. It is the prodigal son seeking again his father's house. It is also the story of Parthibal, the guy who is fool, who having forgotten or lost the way to the temple of Mount Allah, must wander in black armor for many years, seeking again his own mysterious spiritual heritage. This wandering through the desert is the substance and burden of the Odyssey and the Idapoma. Because in the return of, uh, of uh, Ulysses or Odysseus to his own far distant native land, we find the story of the journey of the soul through the wilderness. 
is among the pietists of provincial Pennsylvania, here among the Dutch people. They had a society which was called the Society of the Women of the Wilderness. And it represented the concept of human prevail in darkness seeking for truth. This is essentially the story of the wandering in the tribes of Israel. And when we recognize, for instance, that the twelve tribes can symbolize the twelve convolutions of the human brain, and consequently all of the attributes of man's thought and emotion, we can see why the wanderings of these through the wilderness of ignorance is an almost inevitable prerequisite to the attainment of wisdom and security. We have, therefore, this symbolic pattern moving through. But the great and wonderful point in connection with this phase of the story is the uh, revelation of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. Now, of course, the biblical account of this is comparatively a bridge. But there is much more to be found in the old Jewish tradition that has ever been um, brought out and brought to the consideration of non-Jewish scholars. According to the old tradition, Moses ascended Mount Sinai three times. On the first ascent of the mountain, he was given the Torah. And the Torah is the law. The Torah is the essential statute. It is the root and source of the great Babylonian and Jerusalem Talmud. The great combinations and collections of the law. It is a tremendous revelation of jurisprudence and probably one of the greatest and deepest of all legal codes. The Mosaic Law was for the government of people. It was for the government of a wild and nomadic people. And yet it drew them and brought them under the recognition that civil law and religious law are the same thing, that there was no essential division between them, and that by keeping faith with each other, they kept faith with God. But there could be no deviation. Man could not break civil law without breaking sacred law. We have gradually divided the pattern. Therefore, we today say that if you break a civil law as a crime, to break a religious law as a sin. But in ancient times, there was no division between rules. That which was a crime was a sin, and vice versa. So the great quote, the Torah, was revealed to Moses on the first ascent of Mount Sinai and required for forty days and forty nights. He then ascended the mountain a second time. And on the second ascent, he was given the Mishnah, which is one of the more mystical and secret writings of the Jews. The Mishnah is called the soul of the law. The Torah is the body of the law. The Mishnah is also a work of instruction suitable for the priest, particularly, but also available to the people. And it is called the soul of the law. And it is, the, it is intimately associated with the ancient spaces, the body or letter of the law killeth, but the spirit of the law giveth life. Therefore, the Mishnah was the soul or spirit of the law which gave life. Now, what is life in this sense? In the Mishnah, we learn that life is understanding and that the cold letter of the law becomes warm with life when we understand the reason for the obedience that is required. That when we understand fully and completely, we no longer fear the law, but recognize it as the greater good. Therefore, our fear is gradually transformed into respect. And the Mishnah, which gives man the internal understanding of the Torah and brings this law to life in him and for him, causing it to become a directive of a conduct pattern based upon a rich and warm ideal. This is properly and appropriately called the soul of the doctrine. This is the law for those who are learning, for the thoughtful, we would say today that it is the revelation of the law for the individual who wishes to live better than upon the surface of things. We might turn it mystical, philosophical. We might conceive it uh, even to be psychological, because it is something which makes things more real, more true, more valuable. 
The third time Moses ascended the mountain and remained again for forty days and forty nights, he received the Kabbalah, the secret doctrine of Israel, the spirit of the Lord. He received in this way the great keys to the revelation. And in the uh, Christian dispensation, the papal keys, which were supposed to have been presented to St. Peter, consisted of a silver and a golden key, and they are crossed on the papal arms even today. Well, the silver key is the Kabbalah Moses. The silver key is the mysterious wisdom which unlocks all of the mysteries of the Old Testament. The golden key is the symbol, in this case, of the key which unlocks the mysteries of the Messianic dispensation. So the gold key unlocks the mystery of the law, the golden key unlocks the mystery of grace. And the law and the grace are the two great columns represented by the campanella on the fronts of churches. In uh, Notre Dame de Paris, there are the two great towers. One is the power of the prophets, and the other is the power of grace. But man shall enter in between law and grace, which is appropriate and proper to this mystery. Moses, in receiving the Kabbalah, received the great keys of Gamatria and the Karakon, the methods of unlocking the secret will. He became aware of the meanings of all of the words. And he received also the Sefer Hedibran, the Book of the Words, by means of which all of these mysterious terms can be unlocked. He was then in the position uh, that is described a little later in the medieval period by, Rosa, uh, by uh, Rabbi Moses Ben Maimon, known better as Maimonides, the great Jewish teacher and free philosopher. He declared that the mysteries of truth, like the human body, consist of three parts. First, there is the garment which conceals the body. This is the soul. Here is the body of the law. Then there is the body which is contained within the garment. This is the mission, which is the soul. And then there is a light with, which is contained within the body. And this is the innermost. And this is the Kabbalah. And as a man so of wisdom, it must be threefold in three parts. Its inner part failed by its outer members. And its outer part are for all. The parts are for all. But the inner part is only for atheists, those who are dedicated eternally to the service of God. And the revelation of the Mishnah is to the prophets, and the revelation of the Kabbalah is to the saints, or to the holy ones who have been sent by special revelation. And it is said in the old verse later that the secrets of the Kabbalah were entrusted to Solomon, king of Israel. And we want to pause here just a moment because in referring to the Pentateuch, we are referring to the five books of Moses. And we are well aware, and the question has recently been asked us, what of the sixth and seventh books of Moses? There are two books that are generally found in paper binding and are catch penny publications that are called the sixth and seventh books of Moses. And we must pause for a moment on this particular subject. Because of the nature of the Jewish doctrine and the Jewish revelation, and because of its tremendous emphasis upon uh, the septenarial division of the universe. There is a very ancient legend that the original books of Moses were seven, and the two were concealed or hidden. This was because man has five vowels, and a sixth and seventh partial vowel, represented today by two consonants, with partly vowel sounds. There is a sixth and seventh vowel. Man has five senses, but there is a sixth and seventh sense concealed within him, not yet developed. Also in the Bodhisattva doctrine of Northern Buddhism, the Mahayana system, there are five Yana Buddhas, but there are two others hidden. 
For in the ancient system, the world is fine, revealed, and too concealed. And the ancient said that this was according to the law and the body. For in man, there were supposedly five vital parts revealed and too concealed. And in the life of man, there are five parts which are regarded as perfect, and two which are regarded as imperfect. And the creation itself requires seven days. And all of these working together would lead to the assumption that the great Kabbalistic schools from which the Mosaic doctrines originally received their form and final presentation may very well have possessed what were called the sixth and seventh books of books. There also are, according to the uh, Oriental anthropologists, there are five races upon the earth and the sixth and seventh yet to come. In the old system of astronomy, not our present system, there were five planets, a sun and moon, or two luminaries, which substituted the two invisible planets which we have later discovered. The ancients knew they existed, but did not desire to reveal them. So this concealment of two in the midst of five is a very ancient formula of uh, Kabbalah and related material. In this uh, concept, it was believed that the six and seven books of Moses uh, were held in secret by a mysterious order which arose among the ancient Jews, and that these two books, because of the final failure of man to meet the challenge of the dispensation, were, were taken back to the heavenly college by the angel Razino and are no longer upon the earth, because man was not yet worthy of them. But that in the fullness of time, these other two books would come and would be revealed. And of course, the seventh book is the famous book without words, because on the seventh day is the great rest, or the Sabbath, or the eternal silence. So that the seventh book is the book of the great silence, the seals of which may never be opened. But what we call today the sixth and seventh books of Moses, and what are now in circulation, are really, uh, I hate to say it because I'm not of a critical mind normally, they're just old-fashioned forgeries. <laughs> <laughs> they arose at a time in the Greek people where men's minds were greatly involved in witchcraft. And witchcraft and demonology did arise among the Jewish communities after the diaspora or the scattering of Israel. Therefore, in the old Polish synagogues and in various parts of Europe, uh, there were old rabbins who followed ceremonial magic, who tried to raise spirits like Faust of old, and a uh, very good play dealing with that subject has been so, uh, very popular in this country. It is called the Book. And this is a story of the enchantment, of witchcraft, of the spelling of spirits. And it's not at all unlike uh, corresponding stories found in, this, in the annals of the Inquisition, like the Malak Malakicarum and other similar parables. But the sixth and seventh books of Moses are in the class of grimoires, or books of magical formulas. They have no basic uh, origin in the original doctrine. They would not rather be said to be perversions or degenerations of the great basic principles of ceremonial magic. Ceremonial magic was part of the Bible. Ceremonial magic dealt with man's ability to control the powers of the universe. But these secrets were never revealed, and I cannot be bought for 25 cents in the near I assure you, and I wouldn't become at all excited over the problem. Now we turn again for a moment to the story of Moses. One of the important things that we learn concerning the, the story of Moses are certain legends relating to the revelation of the tablets of the law on Sinai. Now, these revelations tell us that the two tablets of the law were what was called in that time the male and female tablet. In other words, one tablet had letters raised upon it and the other had letters engraved into it. So that when the two halves of the tablet met, they became one solid stone. Uh, we are now assuming, of course, that on these tablets were originally written 
But the Ten Commandments, as we know, uh, that is not essentially true. And they were not so inscribed. In the oldest known form, the tablets contained two columns of letters. Each tablet with five letters. These letters, in turn, contain the um, stenographic abridgments of certain words from which other combinations could be made. At another time, they contain the ten names of the septile, or the tree of creation, the ten names of the ten worlds, to each one of which a law or a certain truth was intrinsic. These tables were originally, it is said, upon a transparent stone. And this transparent stone, according to one account at least, was given to Moses by God out of a mysterious abode in heaven, and it was called a sapphire. It was an enormous sapphire. And when Moses broke these tablets, and in his repentance, he sought to restore them. He could not. Therefore, he copied the letters upon tables of stone. But the jewel which had been given to him in heaven had been shattered and lost, and the parts of it were returned to God. And this man had not the original revelation, but carvings of it upon stone. Therefore, according to the ancient Jewish history, we have to understand that by the inscription upon stone, we represent the material uh, law. The law which says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But that the law of mercy, because man had perverted it, was restored to heaven to wait for a better time. All of these little interludes coming into this story give it a great deal of richness and color and, and tremendous uh, overtone, moral significance, spiritual mystery. Also, it is said that when Moses ascended the mountain, he found upon the top of the mountain a great cloud. And as he approached it, the cloud opened. And he saw in the cloud, in the form of the cloud, a great cave leading apparently far into the sky, a cave of clouds. And in this cave, a great light hovered and floated, and from the light came the voice that instructed him. And as we study the story very definitely, we study Mount Sinai, and we compare it with all the world mountains and all the great religious hills and the mountains from which come in our help. And we know that what Moses is trying to tell us is the story of, of an internal spiritual experience and that the entire story deals with man's retiring into the innermost part of himself. Uh, there is an early work on Jewish anatomy, which was circulated in Spain during the 15th century, which shows the world distributed on the human body. And in this arrangement, Mount Sinai is located in the heart. Therefore, we are beginning to sense that it be in the wandering of the wilderness that this mountain of health or strength is the heart. And that the heart again later becomes the symbol for the Ark of the Covenant and for the other mysterious symbols which are associated with the uh, Jewish religious symbols. Thus Moses is telling us of a retirement into the innermost nature and uh, the deeper parts of his own being. And the historical mountain is only a symbol of this other mountain. And Mount Ararat, upon which the ark descended, is also a symbolical mountain. For it is the mountain upon which the spiritual life of the race finally touches its material foundation. And in all these, like the Septuaginta cave of the illumination of Buddha, in the room, the house of seven rooms, it is the heart. And uh, in one of the old Egyptian manuscripts, we are told that the Great Pyramid was the heart which was set up in Egypt. So we have the mountain, the pyramid, the mountain, all symbolizing the sanctuary of God. And that this sanctuary is essentially all the symbolical of the human heart. So Moses enters into the holy place, into the high place of his own consciousness, into the aloneness and the aloofness. He transcends the world. He rises above mortal things. And there, in the inner mystery, he receives the inward impression of the tables of the law. But when he trusts this impression to his mind and his outer personality, he cannot express it. He destroys it. He is unable to reveal it. All he can make is a copy of the stone. And each of 
Yeah, how about so has ever had a very great and beautiful thought within ourselves knows what that means. We try so desperately to give that thought, to share that thought, that all we can pass on is a hollow, stone-like symbol of it, because the reality simply cannot be captured within our own experience. There is a very wonderful story relating to Moses at the time of the wars of Israel. And at that time, Moses went up to a hill, and he was old, and he could not stand long. Therefore, a stone, a rough stone, was placed for him to sit on. And on each side of Moses uh, stood one of the great elders of the people of Israel. On one side stood Aaron, the priest. And on the other side stood Elu, the general of the armies. And it was the law of that uh, battle that as long as Moses' arms were held up, the children of Israel would be victorious. But the moment his arms fell, the enemy would win. Now Moses was old, but he could not hold up his arms. So Aaron upon one side, and Hugh upon the other side, held up his arms for the day. And when night nearly came, and the battle was not decided, Moses asked the Lord to extend the day until the battle was completed. And on that occasion, the day was extended. And it was again extended in the time of Joshua, who was caused to make the sun stand still. But the, uh, the story of Moses and his arms being upheld by Adam and Hugh is very, very interesting because Moses is the law. If men uphold the law, they are victorious. If they allow the law to fall or to fail, all is lost. So that the priesthood upon the one side, which is religion, and the general of the armies, which is man's knowledge, his science, his material attainments, both of these must sustain the law, one on each side. And if they sustain the law, the armies of Israel will be victorious over the kingdoms who would otherwise destroy them. And in this we have, of course, another evidence, a symbolic evidence, that we are referring primarily to Moses as the embodiment of a great hope who keeps the law and kept by the law, who breaks the law and perishes from the law. And in this, the law of the prophets are fulfilled. So in these five books, we have the, ev the evolution or the development of these five steps. We have in the uh, last book, Deuteronomy, we have the three great discourses of Moses, in which he gives to his people the full, now a mature reflection of the law. He shows the law in its most natural nature, at one moment firm and relentless, at another moment kind and gentle, sometimes apparently hard and tyrannical, sometimes appearing to work for darkness, at other times with every solicitude uh, for the most sensitive and tender consideration. And thus is how, this is how we see the law, one moment as a tyrant and one moment as a benefactor. And having given his final instruction to his people, or revealed itself or himself through this great priesthood which he created, uh, Moses, because he was not yet perfect, was not able to go as far as the people he would leave. And so he went to sleep on the hills of Moab, <laughs> and the place knew him no more. But we have here a wonderful inner statement. The law is in us. The law is in Alabama. A strange deep prophet, a patriarch, a voice of strength which comes to us in our own instincts. We are the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness. We have within ourselves we have the ancient one, the law, the tradition of our kind. And in the mosaic of the dispensation, the emphasis is upon the great body of the law that has descended to us. It is the law that has come from the experience of our people, the experience of our race, from the traditions of the good and the wise and the true. And in each one of us, it is an archetypal form of our law, an archetypal form which has come within our own consciousness and our own understanding. It is the law of the folk. It is the law of the race, the law of the kind. We are born in it. It is in our blood. It comes down to us uh, from the first nutrition that we receive from our mothers. It is the law of our kind. It is the law of the jungle or the plain of the desert. It is the law that the animal and man both must obey. And this is the old law, the law which goes on forever, apparently represented by this, the patriarchal concept. Now it is against this law, later, and 
against the strange severity of it that we find the rise in the Messianic tradition, not only among Christians, but also among the Jewish people themselves. For the law led inevitably to the prophets, and because the prophets were the ones who broke through the law, because the prophets were the ones who had the vision of a great release from the concept of law as dominance, release from the law as strength or pressure. It is because of that that the prophets began to sing. It is because of this release that we have Isaiah. It is because of the problem, the burden of it, that we have Job. It also is the burden of the release of Ezekiel. And we find something of this new note, this new tremendous power in the songs of Ruth and Esther. So that from the law, a people passes inevitably from the acceptance, from obedience, from domination, towards a mystical release. And this mystical release we begin to consider in what we term the prophetic voice. And I think that's about enough for one evening. <laughs> the unfoldment of their religious and political psychology, the rise and fall of their national existence, and furthermore, it gives us a broad picture of the psychological structure of the Jewish people of that time and of their religious problems and of their general attitude towards the essentials of spiritual life. But it should be included, seems to be more than justified for the word of Jesus himself, when he proclaimed definitely that he came not to destroy the prophets, but to fulfill them. And in order that the position of the prophet whom he came to fulfill might be understood, it was almost inevitably necessary to link the Old Testament and the New. The Old Testament was not written originally in the same language as the New Testament. The linguistic difficulties in the older Chaldaic Hebrew are far more ponderous and numerous than those of Greek. Up to the present time, no really ancient manuscript of the Old Testament is the Jewish writing is known. Nearly all of the so-called scrolls and sentences now to be found in synagogues are translations and retranslations from the Greek. The only manuscripts of the Old Testament are to be found in the great Greek manuscripts of the Bible. The and the Vatican. These manuscripts, dating from about the third century, are the oldest comprehensive group we have. There are earlier fragments, but they do not give us too large or full an understanding. Thus we know that we are confronted with serious problems of language. And we must gradually recover from our popular belief the Bible was written in King James at the request of King James the first of England. It was not this is an exaggeration. <laughs> the uh, Old Testament was probably revised or codified sometime about the fifth century BC. There is a strong record or tradition at least, not on the same, but I'll point that out but still rather strongly defended, uh, that the earlier writings were almost completely destroyed, and that during the time of Ezra, a group of scholars forming a rabbinical college, working together, perhaps under the leadership of one or two of the older patriarchs, rewrote or revised and brought into an integrated form the earlier and lost manuscripts. In order to approach the Old Testament as a compound, we know that for Christian people, the Old Testament forms a background or frame 
for the Messianic revelation and to the which Christendom is particularly, uh, I think, the religious thing. Uh, this is entirely a different viewpoint from that of the Orthodox Jews. He does not regard the Old Testament as reading a complementary Bible or word. He is willing to admit that particularly the prophetic books of the Old Testament do contain information or announcements of the coming of a Messiah. Uh, Christian theologians have assumed rather dogmatically that these indications and implications refer to the advent of Jesus. Here, of course, is one of the major points of difference between Judaism and Christianity. This attitude is not acceptable in general to the Orthodox Jewish scholar. He points out many elements of the Old Testament account which would sustain his position that the New Testament is not the fulfillment of the Old. If the two books have been brought together for other purposes, or at least have achieved a different purpose. In survey, we must remember that the New Testament, as it stands, is essentially a moral historical document. It deals with the life of Jesus of Nazareth and to a degree of the lives of his immediate disciples and apostles. It passes into the Pauline epistles and gradually develops a related field of literature. It is a powerful moral work. It is a tremendous statement of mystical faith. And it is a strong and definite revelation of religious ethics. If the New Testament is deficient in one particular, when compared with most of the sacred books of the world, it is deficient in cosmology. It is deficient in anthropology. In other words, it does not carry into its own substance any essential description or explanation. For this reason, the Old Testament forms an appropriate background. It answers certain questions concerning the race and the nation for which Jesus came, the beliefs of this race. It is sometimes assumed that there were originally seven continents and, five, and three bodies. This may not be entirely correct, but it does indicate that as we retire further into the background of the branch, we are inclined to know the increasing signs of efficiency of available words and terms. Now, this particular problem does present itself to Bible students. Uh, we are not at all sure of all of the grammatical construction of the old Jewish and Rabbinical teachers. The same problem concerns us with the Christian heritage. Uh, since the work of Caporium and the discovery of the Rosetta Stone, we can translate uh, such Egyptian manuscripts as the books of the dead and uh, other surviving fragments of Egyptian uh, mortuary uh, offerings and things of that nature. Prayer. But we are not at all sure that we are exhausting the potential of the language. Dr. Press of the University of Chicago told me in his work in connection with Egyptian manuscripts that he was quite certain that many of the word signs and glyphs had double meaning, and that we have simply lost the knowledge of the better and deeper meaning. This would be definitely true in connection with the old Jewish language. Jewish scholars themselves know definitely that there are meanings to these words and to the combinations of them. Uh, with which we are no longer committed. Therefore, that we can read the surface, but we cannot penetrate to the subsurfaces of the ideas and mental processes of the time. This could and does lead to a great deal of danger and error. But where we, uh, we have not the psychic sympathy with the original, we cannot any longer relive the idiom of the article. We are at a very serious disadvantage. Even today, the American people do not use their languages correctly. 
and if a scholar does use it correctly, it is likely to be misunderstood. <laughs> and uh, this follows all the signs and habits. Words change their meaning. Words increase in importance and decrease and structure in the same way. The beginning of the study of the Old Testament, then, should naturally and reasonably begin with a careful study of the philosophy of the great writings. Without some knowledge of this particular field, there is always going to be a very difficult situation at hand. The writing is not always on the surface. The writing is definitely subsurface. We know, for example, that uh, due to certain religious conditions, the old texts are left without following. <coughs> without following. And the latest development of the diagram from Mark does not indicate any sure knowledge of where they belong, or this may or may not be a sensible attitude or belief, but it is certainly traditional and has been in existence for a long time. Nor is it essentially unreasonable, for it is quite possible that a religious literature in uh, Palestine, a thousand years before the beginning of the Christian era, uh, was highly respectable. In those days, manuscripts were very few, and copying was an exceedingly difficult undertaking. Therefore, it is quite possible that not many uh, manuscripts of the Torah or of the prophetic books or of the literary works were available. These could either have been lost or so hopelessly misplaced uh, that they were not available. This point, of course, is also strengthened by the fact that they have never discovered any of And therefore, they could not have been especially numerous. We have many, many copies of Egyptian manuscripts going back as far as 3,000 or 3,500 BC. But we have no such available manuscripts relating to the Old Testament. Thus, it is quite possible that the literature was exceedingly limited in the mouth and uh, perish or nearly perish in the numerous vicissitudes of the place of the tribes of Israel. So much for its basic uh, historical orientation in the limited time that we have. The second point for consideration is the authorship of the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch is generally referred to as the five books of Moses. We have, however, no absolute proof that Moses was their author. Nor do we gain such an evidence or proof from the reading of the books themselves. Most of the writing is in the third person. This, however, is not again concluded because of the grammatical form used at that time. We do not, however, have the internal or sustained traditional evidence to prove that Moses was the actual author of these books. He is the traditionally accepted author. It is not impossible that he did write that. This is a world of the religious but uncertainty which is as yet unsolved. There are some groups, composed of rather adequate scholars, are inclined to favor the belief that Moses did write these books. There are others who feel definitely that he probably did not. Then there is a third group, occupying a more or less middle ground, that point out that according to the custom and the propriety of the time, Moses undoubtedly would have made you surprised. In other words, he probably would not have written the book for his own hands. He would have used professional writers or secretaries. And that these may have changed from time to time. And thus, uh, we would have certain editorial differences, different methods of presenting material. This is quite possible. Also, we know beyond any reasonable doubt that although we might have attributed the authorship of the Pentateuch to Moses, but there are fragments, sections, and parts of it that are almost certainly derived from older sources. Some of these sources may have been Egyptian. Some of them may have been oral traditions of surrounding tribes and groups. But frequently in the unfoldment of the uh, Mosaic writings, we find interludes or interpolations which can definitely be traced to other sources. These include a considerable part of the opening of Genesis. And the uh, Chaldean tables, now in the British Museum, are translated by Professor Piazza's work, indicate a considerable part of Genesis 
story was derived from the Chaldean Cuneiform, a much older tradition, going back long before even the so-called uh, great state of creation. Thus, we uh, can find the probability of several authors, or we can find several layers or levels of writing representing extracts from different periods. We must also face the inevitable that there are interpolations of a later date that could not possibly have been written by most. Whether these interpolations were originally glossed and were gradually incorporated into the text, we do not know. But we do know that this particular occurrence has taken place in the Christian writings, and a number of quotes of as late as the 8th century indicate that scribes made marginalia, or notes on the edges, and later scribes incorporated these notes into the text, so that we have a little difficulty arising from this gradual loss of lines of demarcation between original material and interpolated or interpretive material of a more recent date. The Jewish religious tradition is a much more complicated one uh, than we are first inclined to assume. Uh, these people, as you can well imagine, uh, being an ancient and oriental nation, developed immense and incredible religious hostility. Uh, they were never content merely to accept the letters and forms and shapes of things. They always sought for something deeper, something more important. And in the development of their sacred writings, they appear to have incorporated uh, many mysterious kabbal or ciphers into the text of their work. These ciphers originated at least in part from their concept of language. Originally, the uh, old Hebraic or Chaldean Hebraic language was rather more limited than it is today. There was probably a time when the complete alphabet did not consist of more than about 10 or 12 letters.